you might all be thinking, what is an American, um, Latin American uh, lawyer doing <laughs> on a panel about the Belt and Road Initiative? And you're absolutely right to think about that. As you've seen in my colleague's presentation, and Andre can now, you can now put it. Yeah. There we go. Yep. I take it from here. As you've seen in my colleague's presentation, when we think about Belt and Road, this is what you usually see, the terrestrial belt going into Europe and the maritime uh, road going into Africa. But Belt and Road is actually much more than that. Uh, if it, this is how it really is. So you have uh, at least 16 countries in the Latin American and Caribbean region that have already signed the MOU, MOU related to the Belt and Road Initiative. So Belt and Road is much more than uh, the recreation of the Silk Road of the past. When you look into the uh, Chinese investments uh, in the last 11 years, you see that 10% of all Chinese invest in investment actually came to Latin America. And also, when you look at uh, countries uh, in this region that have already signed uh, the B uh, BRI MOU, you see that the number, the number is really uh, very impressive. And even though we have 16 countries that have signed the MOU of the Belt and Road Initiative in Latin America and the Caribbean, four of the largest countries in the region have not signed them yet. And I'm talking about Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, and Argentina. So uh, let's take a look at the investments in the region in comparison to the investments, Chinese investments worldwide uh, regarding the Belt and Road Initiative. So worldwide, uh, for the past uh, seven years, the, uh, China has invested almost $690 billion uh, regarding Belt and Road Initiative. If you look into Chinese investments in South America alone in the same period, you're talking about $95 billion, of which more than half went to only two countries, Brazil and Argentina. Brazil taking the largest part of it, thank God. <laughs> so the first conclusion that we can, uh, can have here is that joining, formally joining the Belt and Road Initiative is not or has not been key to receiving Chinese investment. And as a good arbitration counsel that I think I am, I'm introducing evidence to that. <laughs> this is yesterday's edition of the China Daily in which it states that Brazil has received in 2017 a huge Belt and Road investment from PetroChina, except that Brazil is not a part of the Belt and Road. So if Brazil has received an investment that is treated as a Belt and Road investment without being formally a part of the Belt and Road, I have to conclude that the Belt and Road is more of a brand or a mindset of investment rather than a binding program of investment uh, from China to other countries. So this is the first important conclusion I think we may have. So which types of disputes may arise from uh, investments from uh, the Belt and Road Initiative? Well, the first one, uh, of course, is infrastructure. Most of the investments arising from the Belt and Road Initiative are related to infrastructure. This is an example from Argentina, the renovation of 1.7 thousand kilometers of the Belgrano Railway. It was 70% funded by China. It's a two billion investment. And everybody knows that Argentina is in pretty good shape economically, right? So <laughs> maybe disputes may arise from that, not only on the infrastructure side, but from the landing side. What if these uh, uh, locomotives, carriages in, uh, uh, do not work properly? What if Chinese engineers that are working in Argentina uh, do not comply by Argentina, with Argentinian law regarding the construction or, or the maintenance of these machines? So you see that it's a lot of disputes that may arise from this type of investments. When you look at uh, infrastructure investments, you also see an impressive number here. Uh, these six countries on the map account for 52 out of 69 Chinese investments uh, of infrastructure uh, projects in the region. And they account for 88% of all jobs generated by uh, the infrastructure sector uh, uh, regarding Chinese investments. So you're looking at massive, uh, uh, a massive number of projects concentrated in these uh, six countries. Other types of issues, concessions. So you have, for example, a, a huge investment from Chinese uh, state grid in Brazil when it acquired uh, CPFL, which is the second largest energy distributor in, in the country. Uh, it has uh, 9.6 million clients. 
It uh, encompasses 687 cities. Well, these concessions will be over in 2027. And so there's going to be need for renegotiation of these concessions, re uh, 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 renewal of the concession, and therefore disputes may arise. Also disputes right now regarding the uh, review of tariffs that are charged by these companies to the final uh, consumers. So st State Grid now is responsible for 14% of the energy distribution in Brazil. So it's a huge investment that may also generate some sort of dispute. Landing disputes, of course, uh, uh, there's a massive landing of money from China uh, to Latin America. Just today I've read on the newspaper that in last, uh, the meeting that uh, President Bolsonaro, President Xi Jinping had in Brazil this week, uh, uh, President uh, Xi Jinping just promised uh, to offer a $100 billion uh, line of credit for investments in infrastructure in Brazil. So there's a lot of landing to uh, South American countries. You see that of the estimated $140 billion uh, landing of China to Latin America since 2005, over 90% of that went to four countries, Venezuela, Brazil, Argentina, and Ecuador, none of which are in good economic shape. So uh, when you look at the, the possibility of these countries uh, defaulting on this, uh, this debt, this is not a, a small probability. This is actually very likely that at least some of these countries will not be able to repay this debt, and therefore we may or may not have something similar to what happened in Sri Lanka, as mentioned by my previous uh, colleague. Post M&A disputes, of course, you have M&As that go south, liabilities arising, uh, contingencies arising from the M&As, undisclosed contingencies. These also may generate uh, very uh, common and usual disputes that we see so far. And finally, and very importantly, environmental disputes. So we have this example of the company called Chinalco in, in Peru that had to relocate an entire village of 5,000 people in order to keep exploring copper mines in the region. So most of these uh, investments in the region uh, regarding the Belt Road Initiative are highly, uh, they highly impact the environment because they are huge uh, uh, works regarding uh, energy, uh, uh, the, the building of uh, the exploration of mines, the building of hydro plants. So they have a clear impact to the environment and this impact may also generate uh, disputes uh, in the region. So what are the mechanisms available for these disputes? My colleague has already mentioned lots of them, but I should uh, add that in Latin America, you have not all the countries are signatory to the ICSID convention. And therefore, only some of them, in only some of them, you'll be able to have investment arbitration. So you see, for example, that Brazil is missing on that list, evidently. However, even though some of these countries are not signatories to the ICSID Convention, all of these 12 countries in the region have bilateral investment treaties with China. So in all these countries, Chinese investors may have at their disposal the uh, uh, investor state uh, arbitration. In Brazil, uh, Chinese investors do not have uh, that available, and therefore they have to rely on uh, international commercial arbitration and also arbitration against the public administration, which is allowed by Brazilian law as of now. And specifically here, there will be a difference, a very important difference. If you're talking about uh, Chinese companies investing in Brazil, they may have arbitration against the public administration, but this arbitration will have to be seated in Brazil and Brazilian law will be applicable. However, if you have international organisms such as the Asian Development Bank, for instance, lending money to Brazil, the ex Chinese Exim Bank lending money to Brazil, in these cases, these restrictions of the Brazilian law do not apply. So they may have arbitrations against the public administration outside Brazil and not with Brazilian law applicable to it. So international organisms are not under these restrictions of Brazilian law. Of course, you have uh, the courts to go to, but as Sir Jack mentioned, that we do not like former judges. We in Brazil do not like current judges. So, and I think Chinese investors also would not like them. I hope there is none of them here at this moment. And finally, uh, to answer the question posed on the panel, are there going to be thousands of arbitrations? Well. Uh, maybe yes, uh, the Sri Lanka example uh, mentioned before is a good one. 
Even though one may argue that the history is a little bit different in that case, because if you look at how Sri Lanka's debt is structured, uh, you see that I, I believe 80% of this debt is with Western banks. So one may argue that Sri Lanka had to lease the port to China in order to repay it, the Western banks and not the Chinese debt. So uh, I, don't, I don't believe that we can make that call about a debt trap diplomacy yet. And finally, there's a good example here that maybe uh, we will not be seeing that many uh, disputes because China, Chinese culture is, tends to be more uh, mediating, negotiating culture, uh, uh, and not, uh, tends not to go into disputes that much. So you see the example in Malaysia, it's a very clear example of that. In Malaysia, you had a, uh, a huge, the East Coast Rail Link project that was to be, the budget was about 15 billion dollars, and the new government that took office said, we don't want that, that's too expensive. Instead of trying to force Malaysia into accepting it, China reduced the budget by one third, and now the cost of the project is 11 billion, and it's moving forward. So I think that when you look into Chinese investments, you look at a culture that is a win-win culture, it's a long-term relationship, and therefore, they are going to avoid as many disputes as possible, so as for this project to move on. So uh, thank you very much for your attention, and uh, hopefully we'll get some questions from you. I cannot wrap up this without thanking the organizers, Andre, Felipe, and Ron for inviting me. Thank you very much.